Okay. Well, thank you very much. I just want to make sure that you can see my screen. I'm sharing. Okay. Can you, you have it? Yes. Okay, great. All right. We will get rolling and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, appreciate those words. Uh, I am Russell Cleveland and I'm the quality director for the floor covering division. Uh, at Milliken and Company, and it's my pleasure to be with here, uh, be with you guys today to talk about everything carpet, right? Um, in in today's marketplace, there's so many options available for consumers to choose from when it comes to floor coverings, but carpet is still the leader, right? With the advances in technology and the innovation we've seen over the last few years, our industry and our segment of the industry can provide products that fit essentially every consumer need while at the same time providing greater performance than ever uh, with our products in the marketplace. And because our industry has a track record of providing our customer with what they want, we can easily say that carpet is still the leader in the floor covering industry and it is still growing and it is still evolving. In 2021, uh, floor covering sales in North America were just under $30 billion, uh, even after starting to rebound from the impact of all the COVID. Uh, and sales over the next five years are projected to grow between 4 to 5% all the way out until 2028. And within this floor covering market, carpet commands very close to half, 46, 47% of that volume. So we are in a solid industry with a very bright future. Now, what we would love to do in the next few minutes would be to discuss everything that you need to know about the floor covering market and everything you need to know about carpet. Uh, but that may be pushing it for this hour. So our objective today will be to simply provide a very high level understanding of how carpet is manufactured and how it's installed and maintained. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the co uh, more common problems that our customers may run into. Uh, we'll take a look at how our industry is cr contributing to the environmental causes that we all care so much about. And we'll wrap it up with a look at where the market's heading and how we're dealing with some of the uh, supply chains and economic opportunities that we're all facing right now. So let's just go ahead and get started. Um, we're not gonna take a long time on this slide, but there's a couple of interesting things that you should know being in the world of carpet. The carpet has been around for a long time. In fact, just a little trivia for you, the, the oldest known piece of carpet in the world was discovered in the 1940s and it dates back to about five BC and it was discovered in Russia. So carpet's been, a, been around for a long time, but the evolution of the industry really took off and grew around two or three different events in time. Up until about 1900, carpet was either hand woven or hand punched, really just one loop at a time with a needle through a substrate. This was obviously very slow, uh, but it did create product that you know met the need of the day. Uh, but in the early 1900s, the mechanical tufting machine was invented in Dalton, Georgia, and this really revolutionized the productivity for our carpet industry. About 30 years later, these tufting machines, which had really become the workhorses of the industry, became outdated when the mechanics were revolutionized and power was added to the tufting machine. So you can see how that would significantly increase our productivity. And then around the mid 1940s, man-made fibers were introduced. And as more and more carpet products moved from the natural fibers of cotton and wool over to the synthetic fibers, this really catapulted carpet into a whole new category of being a high performing flooring product, you know, thanks to the performance of these new synthetic fibers. By 1963, our industry had become a $1 billion industry in North America, and it's been growing ever since. And we would attribute this growth to several things. First of all, with the technology available to us today, look, the, the, the design possibilities and coloration options are really endless. You can do anything you want to. And, and carpet can add significantly to the design and to the decor of any home or building. Um, not only does it look beautiful, but it offers uh, acoustic properties and ergonomic benefits over hard surfaces. And carpet just brings warmth to a room that you just don't get from any other floor covering product. Um, it's comfortable, it's relatively easy to maintain. 
And even with the most recent innovations over the last few years, carpet makes multiple positive contributions to sustainability. So there are a lot of reasons why carpet is still the preferred floor covering selection. So let's talk a couple of minutes about the different types of carpeting, uh, carpet manufacturing technologies that are available to us in the marketplace. Carpet manufacturing can, can be segmented into really three really broad technical classifications. First would be the tufting technologies, which make up about 93% of all the carpeting in the marketplace today. And these products have a very wide scope of application in the residential uh, environment, as well as the commercial and hospitality uh, environments. Next, we would have the woven carpets like a, a Wilton or an Axe Minister product. They make up about 4% of the carpet production in North America. And these products have more of a focused application, uh, primarily around the hospitality business. And finally, there are a couple of other technologies like needle punch or fusion bonded that are, that are more specialized that make up about 2 to 3% of the market. Since the tufting technology dominates as the predominant product in the marketplace, let's take a deeper look at this process. There are two pictures on this slide that present just a very high level and oversimplified explanation of the tufting process and how it works. Uh, on the left picture, this represents the actual tufting process. And, and look, there are numerous variations of this process, but again, at a high level, we have the yarn and the primary backing, which are fed into the tufting zone, where the yarn would be tufted into the primary backing using a threaded needle. And in conjunction uh, with a mechanical loop row on the other side of the primary backing, the carpet pile or loop would be formed. Uh, the yarn can be fed into the machine, either from a creel or from beams. Uh, and there may, may be as many as 2,000 needles working simultaneously across the width of the machine to form these loops. Uh, a knife blade can be added to, to work in conjunction with the looper to cut each loop as it's, as it's formed, and that would create a cut pile carpet as opposed to a loop carpet. Uh, the next process would be to add some type of a latex coating to the back of, back of the carpet, which would lock that yarn in place. And then a secondary backing would be added to the carpet to finish out the construction. And on the right hand side, you'll see a drawing of a cross section of a finished piece of carpet. And I've highlighted three of the variables that we can manipulate or alter in order to produce different types of products. The gauge would represent how many needles there are per inch on a given tufting machine. And the stitch count represents how many tufted loops or stitches there are per inch of carpet. So along with the yarn size, the, uh, the stitch count and the gauge and the pile height all together will determine the carpet weight and density. And ultimately, it's the end use of that carpet that would determine you know, how we manipulate these technical elements to produce uh, whatever weight, density, and pile height, pile height would be desired by the customer. And within the tufting technology, there are several different subgroups or variations of basic carpet construction. The most common types of construction would be level loop and level cut loop carpet, where each loop, look, it is what it says, right? Every loop has the same pile height. Uh, and these products uh, have really broad application in commercial, hospitality, and residential uses. And one slight variation of this construction would be the multi-level loop and the multi-level cut loop products. Uh, this technology allows us to produce loops that have different heights from one another, which gives you the physical look and the visual appearance of, of texture that's tufted right into the carpet. We can also utilize different yarn types and fiber types uh, to create a velvet or a Saxony base. Obviously, these are cut pile products with application for hospitality and residential use. Or we can create a frise base or, I guess, the ever popular shag carpet, which are both obviously primarily used in residential applications. Uh, I mentioned a minute ago that, that we can use different types of fibers to give the carpet different visual aesthetics and even different performance char characteristics. Um, the fibers that are used in carpet manufacturing can be broadly divided up into two large categories. Uh, 
First of all, we still have the carpets that are made with natural fibers, right? This is how carpeting started from the very beginning until about the uh, mid 1940s when synthetic fibers were introduced. But these natural fibers still hold on to a certain percentage of the market, uh, specifically wool, which accounts for about 2%. And people choose wool products because for a lot of reasons, look, they're, they're very durable, uh, they wear well, uh, they have a very good reputation for maintaining their color over a long period of time. It's pretty easy to clean and uh, wool is self-extinguishing, so it always gets great flammability ratings and it's environmentally friendly. So there are advantages to it. The downsides may be that uh, wool can be susceptible to the chemistries that we use in our buildings and it is definitely more expensive than its synthetic counterpart. Uh, which leads us to the larger fiber technology category, which is the synthetic fibers. Uh, synthetic or man-made yarns. They account for over 95% of all the manufactured carpet in North America. And some of the most common fiber types are, are nylon, polyester, and polypropylene, olefin. Uh, and generally speaking, synthetic fibers are much more available because of mass production. Uh, they provide great performance characteristics and they offer a wide capability of design aesthetics. You can see on the left side of this chart that the manufacturing processes for synthetic fibers, it's really pretty straightforward. The nylon chips are melted, extruded, drawn down to a specific size, uh, and look at that point, they're ready for production. They're ready to go on a tufting machine. And on the right hand side, you can see that the production of the staple fibers or the natural fibers of wool and cotton is much more complex, much more time consuming and therefore more, more costly. Within the scope of synthetic fiber manufacturing, there's a lot of variables that can be altered or manipulated to provide different physical attributes and different performance characteristics of the fiber itself. For instance, uh, during extrusion process, the extrusion process, uh, there are multiple different fiber shapes or, or cross sections that can be manufactured. And these different fiber shapes can provide different visual aesthetics, different light reflectance. Uh, they can even provide different differential wear uh, and provide different performance levels when it comes to soiling and staining. Uh, obviously, we can produce different fiber sizes or deniers. Uh, and we can vary the twist rate on the fiber. Uh, we can add different chemistries to the yarn to cause them to be more bright or dull or to increase stain resistance and light fastness capabilities. Uh, and then after the fiber is produced, there are a number of processes available to us using air and heat and chemistries that can literally impart a whole new range of physical properties onto the fiber itself. Now, once the carpet has been manufactured, we still have a lot of work to do because our objective really in the end is to ensure that the final customer or the end user is happy and satisfied with the final outcome, which means that the carpet must be installed successfully. Now, during my years of experience, I've learned that there are at least three critical inputs that can impact the quality of the final product, the final installation. And they are, first of all, the site conditions and floor preparation. Uh, secondly, I would say the product quality, meaning the, the quality of the carpet itself. And then finally, the quality of the installation work. So let's take a little deeper dive into each one of these. So let's first talk about site conditions and, and proper floor preparation. Probably the most widely accepted standard for how to prepare a floor to receive floor covering is the ASTM standard F710. Now, uh, you could technically say that this is the standard for preparing floor to receive resilient flooring, but it is also the accept accepted standard for preparing floors to receive both broad loom and carpet tile products. Uh, the standard is very comprehensive, it's very detailed, uh, but I wanted to pull out a few of the more important sections of the standard just for discussion here. So first of all, as we prep the floor, we've got to address the cracks in the floor and the joints that may be there. Any cracks or grooves or depressions, they must be patched and they've got to be smoothed out using the proper material for the, in order for the carpeting product to be installed 
and for it to perform like it's supposed to. Next, the floors should meet some standard for being flat and level or smooth. And this standard may change depending on the product that's being installed. You know, some parts of the standard may be different when we're installing a tile versus a broad loom product. Another example may be that installing a carpet tile with a hard back system may require more floor prep than installing a carpet tile with a cushion as its backing system. But this preparation step, the floor prep step, is done to prevent uh, irregularities in the installation and to present defects from telegraphing up through the new flooring. In other words, the floor needs to be very smooth so that you don't feel chunks of old adhesive or the cracks and the joints uh, in the floor under your feet when you walk across the carpet. Hey, uh, Russell, now, I got a question. <clears throat> got a question for you. The, the flatness, uh, is there a range that you can share with us uh, how much undulation is acceptable, uh, sort of the, the maximum end of the scale to the minimum? I know a lot of carpet tiles call for one eighth over 10 feet. Uh, I used yeah, that's, to think of, of carpet broadloom would be more like quarter inch, but is that correct? <clears throat> uh, yes. Um, different products are going to have different specifications, right? And as you move to more rigid and even with the click systems, they become, they have a higher requirement for being more flat and more level. Some products seem to be a little bit more forgiving, but the standards that you mentioned just now are, are probably the most common. Yeah, and ASTM is calling for three sixteenths over ten feet as a as a sort of a general. So, I guess truly, if you're going to follow the ASTM, although you would follow the manufacturer's installation guidelines before that, uh, ultimately, but um, ASTM is saying three sixteenths over ten feet. So it's interesting that um, that even carpet is fussy when it comes to flatness. Well, it, it can be. Um... Because uh, just take, for instance, and I may be jumping ahead of myself here, but uh, if the floor has too much undulation or unlevelness to it, if you're installing a broadloom tile, you may have a little bit of trouble keeping the pattern lined up against the seams, right? Yeah. So um, it, it's really important to, to have a good flat floor. The, the better substrate you start out with, the more, uh, the more successful the installation is going to be in the end. Uh, and you did make one other good point. I'll always say that the ASTM F, F710 standard is out there, but manufacturer's guidelines trump the standard. So you really need to be familiar with both uh, so that you don't run into any issues down the line. Okay. All right. Um, next part of the standard that I would just highlight uh, requires that we test for moisture and alkalinity or, or pH. Uh, and this really may be one of the more important steps in the entire process. It, it's been my experience that excessive moisture in the subfloor, and I, I think probably we're dealing mostly with concrete, um, that if that moisture is not properly addressed, this can cause as many failures as any other part of the process. And I, I could speak for an hour just on moisture alone, but failures related to moisture content are not only very expensive, but they can be associated with indoor air quality issues and the possible possible growth of mold and mildew. So it's, it's just a problem. It's vital to understand the moisture content of your subfloor before you install any flooring system. Uh, it's also important to understand the pH of the subfloor because if this excessive moisture vapor condenses into liquid water underneath the flooring system, then that pH is gonna be activated and this can lead to the breakdown or the emulsification of the adhesives and can even cause quality issues with the flooring product itself. Um, excessive moisture vapor travel can also cause the accumulation of, of efflorescence on top of the concrete slab. You may have pulled up a tile in the past and seen these white salts that build up sometimes. The buildup of these salts can not only physically, literally physically displace the flooring, but they can contribute to a high pH scenario that can actually break down and deteriorate adhesives. Um, and finally, it's, it's really important that the, the surface of the concrete floor not only be smooth, but it should be structurally sound. Obviously, it should be free of any dust or solvents or waxes or uh, chemistries or adhesive removers, curing compounds. This is right out of the standard. But really, what it's saying is it's anything that's on the concrete that may prohibit the bond between the adhesive and the concrete floor has got to go, right? That's very important. 
And now the responsibility for making sure that this floor is properly repaired, uh, prepared to receive this flooring generally falls on the flooring installation company. So it's really important to understand the manufacturer specs and recommendations for floor prep, no matter what the product is, so that the product will perform like it's expected to. Um, in any case, proper floor prep is critical to the successful installation and, and a happy customer ultimately. After floor preparation, the next critical input required uh, for a successful install would be the quality of the flooring product. The consistency of the quality of the flooring product, uh, that can have an impact on the final outcome. For instance, if there's excessive variation in the size of the carpet tiles being installed, then no amount of floor prep is gonna overcome that, right? If there's variation in the tile size or squareness, the final installation is very likely gonna have seamability issues and maybe even gaps between the tiles. Next, I would say that the product grade can have an impact on the final quality. Uh, this is not to say that manufacturers in the industry are selling subpar quality goods. That is not what I'm saying, but this may be more of a discussion around good, better, best. For instance, um, it, it's typical uh, to use a builder's grade quality carpet in a new residential home scenario, but after a few years, the homeowner may choose to upgrade to a more robust and higher quality grade of carpet. Uh, that would likely be a product that has a heavier yarn weight or density, maybe a different fiber system, <clears throat> and it would be expected to have a greater underfoot comfort, and frankly, it would be expected to last longer. And finally, under this category, I would say technical support can be a factor. You know, are the installation instructions comprehensive and detailed and easy to understand? Do they incorporate visual aids or is it just this long written document that nobody really wants to read? Uh, does the manufacturing offer company offer technical support? You know, if questions come up while I'm installing this product, is there somebody that can call that I can call who may be able to help me with these questions? So so providing a good quality product and the technical support to back it up is critical for successful outcome. And finally, Absolutely. I would say the last piece of the puzzle, uh, which is critical for a successful job, is the quality of the installation work itself. So one of the more widely accepted standards for carpet installation in commercial applications is the Carpet and Rug Institute standard, uh, CRI 104. And for residential installations, it would be CRI 105. And these standards address each one of the critical steps in the process, including tools, handling, storage, site planning, acclimation, and of course the installation process. So let's go through the installation process for each of these. The Russell, uh, let me just jump in a little, a quick um, um, comment on CRI 104-105. Um, I believe I, um, these are free standards online. So if you Google CRI, Car Carpet Rug Institute 104-105, you can download them for free. And they're actually very digestible, easily read um, uh, documents. It's not like you're going to get a ton of small print that, that just um, you know, <clears throat> slows you down, but it's very digestible and very good quality information. Um, so that is a, definitely a plug for, for CRI. They do a great job. Yeah, there's, that is a great resource. The CRI website is a great resource. It has a lot of information on there about maintenance, um, upkeep, installation. It's a great resource, Carpet-Rug Institute. Um, okay, so let's talk about Broadloom Carpet Installation first. And when we're talking about installing Broadloom Carpet, there are three basic installation types that you might choose from. First would be the direct glue down method. And look, it just, it means what it says because you're literally gluing the broadloom carpet directly to the substrate flooring. Um, this is generally the quicker of the installation methods. It's generally the lower cost installation method because it's a single step and you're not using a pad, right? But because of this, because there's no pad, the quality of the floor prep needs to be good. It, needs to, it may become more critical. It needs to be smooth. Uh, and without a pad, you'll notice there's less underfoot comfort, and there's a possibility that the life of the carpet uh, without a pad may be reduced. Uh, the next installation method is called the double stick method. Uh, this is a two-step process where the carpet padding would be glued directly to the floor, and then the broad loom carpeting would be glued to the carpet pad. Uh, you're going to have slightly higher installation cost here, and of course you'll have the cost of the pad as well, but you will definitely notice a higher comfort level underfoot, 
and the pad will help to extend the life of the carpet because pad underneath the carpet will help to dissipate the energy from all of the foot traffic. It'll extend the life of the carpet. Uh, and finally, there is the stretch-in installation method. This is probably the most popular method for installing in residential applications. It tends to be pretty quick and efficient. Uh, the carpet is installed, is stretched in over a pad that is glued to the floor. So you'll have this higher comfort level, uh, more so than with the direct glue down. But this installation may not be suitable for, for, for larger spaces or where there's rolling traffic as, as the carpet may tend to shift or buckle over time. Uh, this slide shows some of the tools that are needed to properly install broadland carpet. You can see the power stretcher, the, the dry line, crab stretcher, stay nails. There's certainly other tools listed that we need. Uh, and you can find a comprehensive list of tools in the CR st CRI standards that we mentioned just a minute ago. So I don't want to go into a ton of detail, but I did want to at least walk through at a very high level the main steps of a direct glue down installation. So the first thing we would need to do is to lay the carpet out according to the seaming diagram. We want to be sure that we have all the right carpet in all the right places that is positioned properly uh, and, and generally, at least generally, generally aligned for pattern. Uh, and then we'll cut the pieces and, and trim the seams. Uh, once all of this is confirmed, then we would want to apply adhesive to the subfloor. Uh, and it's important here uh, to use the proper trowel to make sure that we get the right spread rate, to make sure there's enough adhesive applied to the floor to create the proper bond, right? And after sufficient open time, we would press the carpet into the adhesive and then roll it in. Now, if we're installing pattern broadloom, uh, then this would be the time when we would probably need to use our stretching tools to make sure the pattern is lined up and crosses the seams properly. It may even be necessary to use stay nails to hold the carpet in place while the adhesive cures. And all of this adjustment work would need to be done during the working time of the adhesive to ensure the proper bond between the substrate and the carpet. Russell, and I'll have sorry. one more very... Oh, sorry, Russell. I just I'm wanted sorry. to let you know that we're at the 30 minute mark. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, all right, and one more very important point to add right here. As we cut the carpet to prepare for installation, we may weaken the carpet lamination strength on these edges that we cut. So for this reason, it's just vital to use a seam sealer on every edge that we cut to prevent edge raveling or delamination down the road. Now, this next chart shows the basic procedure for stretching in carpet in a residential application. You can see that there's a very ordered way to install the carpet to ensure there are no wrinkles and that the carpet won't buckle in the future. And it's very nearly impossible to do this flawlessly without the proper tools and without the proper training. All right, now let's just take a quick look at what it takes uh, for a carpet tile installation. So with the installation of any flooring product, including broad and carpet tiles, it, it's it's important that the space and the flooring product are acclimated properly. Some flooring products may experience slight changes in their dimensions as the room and ambient temperature conditions move up and down. Uh, if the site and the product are not acclimated properly prior to the installation, then what you'll probably see is gapping or tiles buckling as the product acclimates itself after installation. Uh, it's also important that we understand the floor plan and the seam Russell, diagram. Uh, Russell, can I just stop you there? Just go back to product acclimation because there's so much misunderstanding around acclimation. You know, I'll just ship the product to site three months before you need to put it in and it'll be fine. That's acclimated. Well, it's the absolute opposite. So, uh, you know, do you, do you publish uh, ranges of relative humidity on site and ranges of acceptable temperature, for example? Yes, uh, they're going to be generally in between 60 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit, but, but what you really need to do, because every product is a little bit different, the construction, the chemistry, the layers, every product is a little different. You need to look in the manufacturer's installation guidelines. The acclimation temperatures and time frames will be in there. It's generally going to be uh, 24 to 48 hours in uh, uh, 60 or 55 to 60 degrees up to 85 degrees. That's generally a range that you'll see, but you really need to look at the specific information from that manufacturer. 
And at nine times out of 10, the, the bottom line, the simple way to approach it is uh, get occupancy conditions, which are often referred to as service conditions. I think they're right. referred refer to as service conditions in the ASTMs that, that deal with this issue. Um, and then do, well, do not ship any product until you have those occupancy conditions. Then you have, once you're there, you have, you have acceptable conditions to acclimate for, for 48 hours. The, that is the ideal scenario, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, okay. Okay. So we're continuing to talk about um, carpet tile installation here on this slide. You'll see some of the tools that are needed. And again, um, comprehensive list in the CRI documentation. So let's walk through the primary steps for a carpet tile installation. First, again, we have to do the floor prep. Like, let, let's ensure that the cracks and the joints or holes are properly patched and leveled. Uh, and the patching and the compact and leveling materials need to be compatible, right, with that substrate. For instance, if there's a high moisture situation, the patch material you use needs to be rated to stand high moisture. Uh, once the floor is prepped, we're ready to install or, or lay down the adhesive. Um, all adhesive have an open time or tack time and a working time. So be sure to reference the manufacturer's guidelines for that as well. What I want, uh, Russell, let me just jump in. Trowels, trowels that are used to spread adhesive are a constant uh, reporting issue for inspectors. And we just dealt with a large carpet tile uh, glue down situation and the wrong trowel had been used and uh, the product was not sticking. I mean, it's such such a fussy detail because you, not only is it the, the size of the notches, but the shape of the notches. And these uh, adhesive manufacturers uh, do an incredible amount of engineering that goes into these products to make them work, provided you use them properly. You, it is a fussy detail, but it's very important because those trowels control the amount of spread rate and the shape of the, uh, the, the shape of the, the uh, trail that they leave is important because some adhesives are designed to uh, lay out and roll into one another before you put the carpet tile down. So the trowel is important. And one of the things that I see people overlooking all the time, you know, um, there may be somebody that's proud that they've used the same trowel for three years. Uh, generally speaking, after you use, uh, use a trowel on one job, it needs to be thrown away because grinding down the trial on the concrete, it's going to change the shape and the size of the openings, which will change the spread rate of uh, adhesive application. So once you've used a trial once on a big job, I throw it out and replace it with a new one. That's see in very your, important. For the you see in your, if you see in your image in the bottom right hand corner, that piece of carpet tile is not a good replacement for a worn out trowel. <laughs> uh, I have seen people get very creative uh, with how they uh, lay down adhesive, um, but yes, uh, that's not something that we typically recommend. It's the exception, but we've seen that, you know, it's just terrible. Um, it's just yeah. facing all sorts of problems. Anyway, so yeah. Okay. All right. So we're ready to install. And when we're installing carpet tiles, we typically start to lay down carpet tiles in a pyramid method, right? We lay down the dry line. Uh, we put one tile beside the other and one on top. This methodology just enables us to keep the installation uh, in line and square, right? And tiles should be seated tightly against each other, uh, tight enough to prevent, pre to prevent gaps, but not so tight as to cause compression or buckling. Continue to build out this pyramid until the space is covered. Then you're ready for the finished work and the cut pieces. All right. Now, let's take a minute to go back and uh, I would say, look, this is, again, well-trained installation teams with the right tools is critical. This is just a picture of an installer using a knee kicker to make sure that the seams on the tiles are as they should be. All right. Let's take a look at some of the more common issues that we may have with some carpet installations. Uh, this is a picture showing broad boom, likely in a residence, showing wrinkles, right? Uh, and it's buckling up. It's really difficult to tell what the root cause of this may be without being on site to do a physical evaluation. But this could be due to poor installation practices, specifically around the stretching insteps. It could be from excessive rolling traffic. And I see a chair pad down there. You know, uh, I wonder if a desk chair is rolled on the carpet a lot. Could that be contributing? Or look, it could be just simply weak lamination strength from the manufacturer. So this carpet would likely have to be restretched or maybe even replaced. 
Do your Russell, do your explosion guidelines call for power stretching? Yes. Because it's just it's Absolutely. the most pol polarized thing. You know, you talk to a flooring contractor, ah, we don't need to power stretch, knee kicker and and, and get on with it. <clears throat> and the manufacturers say, no, 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 no. And even CRI 104, 105 um, calls for power stretching. So if you're not going to do it, you're opening up yourself up to warranty issues if there's a problem. Yeah, I totally agree. All right. Um, this is an example of something that happens when we don't use seam sealer, right? Uh, we need to add the seam sealer to reinforce the seams that we create. And once that first loop comes up, you know, the traffic is just going to accelerate that damage until it's, it's repaired. So seam sealer, again, is very important. Uh, this next picture highlights that look at the black edges along the uh, the baseboard, probably in a residence. This is referred to as uh, black edges or filtration soiling, right? So this typically takes place over a long period of time and it's the result of air passing underneath those baseboards and the carpet will literally filter out all the small particles in the air. And uh, this is a good defect mode that gives you a good example of how indoor air quality can impact your flooring. Uh, it happens less frequently in homes that are airtight. Uh, but it, and it's kind of uh, it's visually disturbing, but it can be cleaned with a little bit of extra effort. Are you living next now, to a coal-fired power plant, for example? <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, I guess there are considerations you have to consider what, what the source of the contamination is. This is important to know that too. So edges are turning black. Time to move. <laughs> Uh, you may not notice anything wrong with this picture at first glance, but if you look right across the middle of the picture, you'll see that the pattern is, is not properly aligned. This is a problem installation where the installer failed to achieve the proper pattern alignment before he glued down the product. And once that adhesive dries, this is very difficult, if not impossible, to, to repair. Uh, you may have seen in a tile installation where the edges may be curling up. And again, it's hard to tell what the root cause is without being there to do analysis, but this could be from excessive moisture vapor travel. It could be from tiles that are installed too tightly, or it could be a defect from the manufacturer where there's just an imbalance in the tension between the layers of the carpet tile. It can generally be repaired with some back bending or de-stressing, but that's expensive and it's disruptive as well. And uh, just one more picture of a defect mode. You can see where the carpet tiles are not properly aligned. This could theoretically come from a tile size problem, but this is more likely an installation error where we got offline or um, uh, got out of square. The tile so, runoff from an undulating subfloor. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So now that the product is properly installed, it just makes good sense that we would employ proper care and maintenance to protect this investment and to keep our uh, installation looking its best, right? So it doesn't take long at all for contamination and soiling to build up on our carpet and to really start to change the way it looks. I mean, after all, we live on this product, we work on this product, and everything from the bottom of our shoes transfers to the top of that carpet, right? Pets, air quality, food and drink, spills and stains all contribute to this soiling and the staining of our floors. And no manufacturer is going to guarantee that the carpet won't get dirty. But if we follow their recommended guidelines for proper maintenance, our carpet can look very good for a very long period of time. Now, each manufacturer may be a little bit different, but generally speaking, there are just a few basic steps we need to follow to maintain our carpet properly. First, anything that we can do to prevent dirt from coming inside will help protect our carpet. This can be done with walk-off mats and entrance mats, barrier products, scraper products. There's a lot of products out there on the marketplace, but we should invest in this preventive measure, right? An ounce of prevention. Um, next, there should be some type of vacuuming schedule in place. It should be very purposeful. Uh, the frequency will obviously depend on the exposure and traffic levels, but this daily activity is just, it's foundational to a good maintenance program. And then there should be a spot cleaning protocol. Most people, most companies incorporate this into their vacuuming schedule because quick attention to spots and stains and spills is really important because the longer a stain stays on the carpet, the harder it's going to be to remove. Uh, and finally, we should give consideration to a deep cleaning schedule. Uh, one example of this may be using hot water extraction, but there are both wet and dry 
deep clean methods on the market today. So typically this would be done maybe once, maybe twice a year, depending on the usage and traffic and application. I would also just one final word here, just to say, I recommend that you really understand any special instructions from your manufacturer uh, that they are followed. Uh, there may be certain requirements that a manufacturer may have in order to keep your warranty intact. So just be aware of that um, as you're making your product selection. Right, uh, let me jump in um, again, Russell. Just another big issue we got in the industry um, at our level, at our end of it, where the installation sort of side of things is customers not understanding maintenance. <clears throat> and so they don't know that probably once every year and a half to two years, they're going to have to to do that hot water extrusion. Um, they're going to have to vacuum every, well, every other day at least to prevent grit and 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 uh, dirt getting down into the fibers where the adhesive holds the, holds the carpet together. You don't do that, it's just going to break down. And there's so much misunderstanding and, and lack of information being passed on to the end user. That's right. If you think about the dirt uh, and little bitty grains of dirt and contamination, that they'll, they'll work their way down to the base of that fiber and they'll sit on the backing. And as you walk on it, it actually just kind of, over time, it just kind of grinds into the carpet and it'll, it'll tear it up. You know, the maintenance steps are not complicated, uh, but you're right. I mean, there's a lot of education and information sharing we need to do because maintenance will make all the difference in the world in getting the most out of your carpet, for sure. So, all right. Um, let's swap topics now for a minute or two. And let's talk about uh, how our industry is having a positive impact on our environment. And I can assure you that our industry is committed to protecting the environment and addressing the sustainability opportunities that we all care about so much. Um, I, I can't take time to speak to everything on this very abbreviated list, but it contains a few of the more prominent programs and certifications and initiatives that manufacturers use to guide our efforts to protect our planet and to provide a safer product, right? And this is gonna be probably an unfair and oversimplified summary, but line item number one, California Prop 65 and the Red List Free Certification. This is administered by the International Living Future Institute. They're, they're basically list of chemicals that are known to be associated with health opportunities or potential health opportunities. And our industry spends significant amounts of time and research and money working to eliminate or reduce the consumption of all of these chemistries in order to provide a healthier product. Uh, several years ago, PFAS chemistries were identified as being a potential health risk. Uh, and these chemistries are used in so many, uh, these chemistries are used in so many different industries, uh, but, and even in textiles, because it provided some sort of soiling protection and it gave a repellency factor to the carpet. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge now, every major manufacturer in North America is now PFAS free, just working to provide a safer and healthier product. Manufacturers can also receive the Green Label Plus certification from CRI once they have either eliminated or significantly reduced their VOCs uh, the uh, volatile organic compounds that are associated uh, with their product. EPDs, uh, environmental product declarations, are very important. They help us understand our carbon levels uh, when we complete our life cycle analysis of our products. Uh, we continue to find ways to drive carbon out, and the industry as a whole is headed in this direction of becoming carbon neutral. Um, and a lot of these certifications on here are focused on the chemistries in the products and the health of the buildings, energy reduction, waste reduction, all those are great. But the Well Building Initiative, which is administered by the International Well Building Institute, focuses on how our products impact the health of the people in these buildings, right? There's multiple categories addressed by this initiative, but one example would be an understanding that properly maintained carpet will provide higher indoor air quality than any hard surface product because the carpet fibers will literally filter particulates from the air, right? One other example may be that installing a carpet tile with a cushion back system will provide acoustic advantages and ergonomic benefits when compared to a carpet tile with a hard back system or other resilient products. Milliken is, we're, look, we're a founding member of the Well Living Lab and we've learned so much about how to re-engineer our products in a way that can positively impact the health of people. 
Um, so uh, for the Russell, last two me, years, Russell, let me just stop you there. Just go back to the slide, um, one slide. This is a, sure. So I just want everybody to dial into uh, the PFAS. We've had a lot of conversation about this. PFAS chemistry is what produces products like Teflon. Uh, and, uh, and you know, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was uh, like Scotchgard for, for carpet would be PFAS chemistry or, or it would be involved. Is that right? It was originally, yes. Yeah. And so it came with a lot of controver uh, controversy. Um, and so it's great to hear that that has actually been overcome and eliminated. There's a, uh, you know, we recommended you watch that film, uh, Dark Waters. If anybody's watched that film, it's the true story of how uh, PFAS was created and how it infiltrated the market and food chains and goodness knows what else. A very interesting film of Mark Ruffalo on Netflix. So go watch it. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs> I actually, I, I, I told you, I started it last night. It is very good, and I, I intend on finishing it in the next couple of days. So, yeah, I, I recommend that as well. But look, that's just another example of when our industry understands that there's a health risk with one of our products or chemistries or mat raw materials, we work very hard uh, to engineer that out as quickly as possible. All right. Uh, look, for the last couple of years, I, I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anybody, but our industry, probably just like every other industry out there, has faced challenges uh, with the supply chain like never before. Uh, I, I would like to think that some of the opportunities are easing up a bit, but even now the challenges with shipping and freight are still creating havoc. Uh, the reliability of everything from international shipping containers, and you've all heard the stories about problems with our ports. Uh, to over-the-road trucking and even local deliveries. It's, it's just nowhere close to pre-COVID levels. And the cost for all of these services are higher than ever to the point where most manufacturers have, have implemented some type of surcharge for freight on almost every invoice that they send out. Um, this is a challenge for all of us. Labor supply continues to be a challenge for um, all of our supply chain. Wages have been driven up, and in and of itself, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we have implemented signing bonuses and retention bonuses. They're now commonplace, but throughout the industry, all of our manufacturers and our supporting supply chains are still continuing to struggle to keep the full staff of people. I think over the last couple of three months, people are coming back into the job market a little bit, but we're still very shy of pre-COVID levels, and it still creates opportunities up and down the supply chain. And all of these factors added together on top of the political climate, uh, the general state of the economy, certain governmental <clears throat> financial decisions, they've all resulted in significant price increases and inflationary pressures for essentially all of our raw materials, especially the ones that may be a derivative of the, of the uh, oil and gas industry. Now, I don't know of any carpet manufacturer who hasn't announced price increases over the last year to year and a half. Some even adjusted prices multiple times. You know, but the strange thing is that for the most part, people understand what's going on and they're continuing to purchase new carpet. But one, this is very interesting to me, one emerging purchasing decision variable that we see now uh, that we didn't so much see in the past is delivery. You know, sure, people are always going to consider the product cost in buying decisions, but I've seen a lot of evidence recently that buying decisions are based more and more on how quickly product can be delivered. The advantage in the marketplace today seems to lie with the company who has managed all of these dynamics in such a way that they're able to outperform their competition on delivery and lead times. And people, look, people are even paying premiums on top of the already escalated pricing if they know you're gonna deliver your product quickly and on time, right? It's very interesting. So where do we go from here? You know, well, I guess if any of you all out there that are listening to this had a crystal ball and could predict and read into the future, you wouldn't sit, wouldn't be sitting here listening to me, <laughs> listening to me, I don't think. But there are some trends that we can take note of to help us guide ourselves in our planning process. So first, from, from everything I can read, is we expect growth. And there's always the normal ups and downs of the economy, but we expect growth. 
Uh, we expect the floor covering market to grow on average from two to three, three and a half percent a year between now and 2028. So we're in a good industry in a good market with a positive future. Uh, next, one, one other observation would be that we certainly notice over the last few years the trend in commercial and hospitality applications are moving away from Broadloom products and they are installing more carpet tile now. Tile is generally installed with less waste. It comes in multiple shapes and sizes. Uh, it's easy to replace individual tiles. It offers a great deal of flexibility and the design opportunities are endless, right? Some market segments are making the move to tile faster than others, but we certainly expect this trend to continue because the advantages that carpet tile bring are just getting too big to overlook. And more installers and finally, available who can more installers available who can install carpet tile versus broadloom. We're seeing a, an absolute uh, I don't know, very difficult to get broadloom yeah. installers these days if you don't have them already. Yep, I agree with that completely. See the same thing. Um, finally, uh, I would say that it's hard to have a conversation about the future of carpet or really any other floor covering product. Uh, you just can't have that discussion without discussing the environment and product sustainability. Uh, and not only is this interest growing, it's been growing over the last several years, uh, but in my opinion, this growth is accelerating. This interest is accelerating when it comes to protecting our earth and making a safer product for people. Um, questionable chemistries, harmful chemistries are being replaced. Uh, there's a focus on reducing the total carbon footprint. Products are being developed with longer life expectancies, with higher recycled content, and with also with a purposeful afterlife. So I, I think we've really only begun to see what all the creative minds in this industry are going to do in this arena over the next few years. So no telling what the future holds, but I think it's bright for our industry. Uh, let me so, just, I got a question about sustainability. How about demand for recycling? Um, you know, I, as, as someone who's been in the flooring industry a long time, I have no, absolutely no idea what happens to my carpet after I throw it in the skip and send it to the recycling plant, if I do that. Um, what, what do you as a manufacturer experience for demand that you, that you do that or that you, you send that message down the chain to the flooring contractor as well? Is there is there chatter about that? Sure, there is, and this is probably one of the areas that makes me think that the growth and in interest in in this whole entire topic is is accelerating. Because speaking with somebody earlier this week and saying, look, you know, through uh, the Carpet America Recovery Act care, we have the pipeline to recycle carpet. That option is available, but five eight years ago when you talk to somebody about yes the carpet can re be recycled here's what you would need to do and it's going to cost you this much the answer was kind of okay thanks but no thanks but that's changed more and more customers and that's really if you talk about the generation of demand it's going to be listening to the customers and what they have to say more and more customers are talking about this more and more customers want to know what options are available and that's going to force the demand in the marketplace to develop solutions and a lot of it comes way upstream to the point where we start uh, designing and developing products with the afterlife in mind right let's don't develop a product that we just you might intend to send it to the landfill. Let's develop products knowing that we're going to recycle it or reuse it or repurpose it. So there's a lot of momentum in that in that very area that you just asked about. Give those the fastest delivery time and you got a two for one. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. Okay, that, that covers my topics. Uh, so I'll just, I'm going to flip back out of, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And cut my video back on and i think we probably have some there were some questions along the way but if there are more questions would love to um would love to field some of those if you like you know can manufacture product called capture are you familiar with that with capture absolutely yeah i don't see it in the market around this area and that's too bad because a lot of uh, manufacturers or carpet mills are promoting their stain resist carpets but uh, or, or their waterproof carpets but the moisture just 
tends to just sink right into the pile. And so you get a lot of uh, wick back, a lot of uh, you know, reoccurring spots and capture was a perfect solution for that. And I'm just you know, wondering why it's not being marketed up here because that was a solution for homeowners to, to solve these problems. Well, it's, it's, look, I'm very familiar with Capture. Actually, Millican is a textile and a chemical company, right? And we developed, invented, and we produce and manufacture Capture. So uh, it, it's out in the field under a couple of different name brands. Um, I believe the name brand for the residential application may be Resista. Um, I can check and I'll be glad to follow up, but I also know that the industry, uh, that segment of our market, we're changing uh, business policies or the business practices right now with the distribution and the management of the capture that's coming into our business as opposed to uh, being a part of the chemical division. So we are going to start selling and distributing that. Uh, so we just need to get you some more specific information. It's a great system. It's a dry system. So wick back is not a problem. Uh, there's a, you can even use it for uh, the deep cleans. Uh, there's a good uh, practice. There's a good procedure for using capture for deep cleans as well. So it is a really good product. Even for upholstered fabrics, I've, I've used it. To Absolutely. Those kind of products. No, it's just, it was just a great product. I, yeah, just, I used to see car. it in the stores here and I don't see it anymore. And I keep complaining. You know, like the, the homeowners need something like that because, the pro, you know, they just, I see just a, a skyrocketing amount of, of uh, reoccurring spots. You know, the, the, yeah, yeah, the stains come out, but, you know, the people have to spend a fortune to try and get these mm. machines to clean this stuff. And if they just had capture, it yep. would solve the problem. Yep. So, Clayton, is this you speaking, Clayton? Yeah, yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Where are you located? Uh, Abbotsford or Vancouver, Canada, Vancouver, B.C., North, north of Seattle. Okay. Okay. I, I'll see if there's any information that I can provide for you, um, but I don't know it off the top of my head. So. Hey, Clayton. Okay. Other questions? Okay, Bob. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Ca Capture was made by Millicare which we no longer have access to. And it's not sold um, retailing in Canada anymore, but it is sold in the United States. Whoops, re by re in retail. But uh, I can help you with that, Clayton. So Russell, I could take care of Clayton. Okay. All right. <laughs> Russell, we, we were, when we were talking before um, uh, the presentation, you'd mentioned uh, how Millikan's <clears throat> visionary leader Mr. Milliken uh, sort of applied his um, mindset to always push the envelope, do things that were good for the environment um, and sort of build a culture around that. Could you share that story with us? Uh, sure, um, Roger Milliken uh, led our company for several years. The Milliken has been around a long time. I believe it's gonna be 156 years old. I mean, we were around when Abraham Lincoln was president here. So been around for a long time. And one of the reasons is because of Mr. Milliken's uh, vision uh, for the company. And uh, uh, he was always one to have a, a, a great concern for uh, the environment. And uh, he, he was uh, an environmentalist before that was even a word, right? And, and one of the examples uh, that that always come to mind. I hear, I love to hear people tell Mr. Milliken stories. He was an amazing thinker. Uh, but our company was building a new plant in South Carolina to finish automotive fabrics. And he was looking, meeting with the team. And look, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the storyline is, the point is the same. Uh, this was in the early 70s. And uh, he was looking over the cost and there was a line item removed for an air abatement system. And Mr. Milliken said, look, are you telling me that for, I'm making this number up, for, for $200,000, I can put a system on this finishing range that will exhaust cleaner air into the environment than, than the air that we're using to produce this products? And they said, yeah, but, you know, it's not a requirement. We don't really need to do it. And Mr. Milliken said, that's a, just a no-brainer. Why would we not um, clean the air before we put it back out into the environment? This was probably around the time or just before the EPA was even a thing. But this is just the way he thought. 
he, he cared about these things from the very beginning, and he created a culture in our company that, that we all care about those things as well. So, Good stuff. Thanks for sharing. Um, I've got a couple of typed in messages here. Uh, can You can purchase the product Clayton was talking about, Capture, online um, through Amazon, through Ace Hardware's Lowe's, Home Depot. <clears throat> so just a comment there. And okay. um, there's a similar product to THD called Resolve if you're looking for Capture. But there's some interesting points. We have any episode above that? Yeah, so um, are there any other questions from the floor? <clears throat> it's a little after two, so we are uh, going, going, gone with the opportunity for questions. So let's wrap this up and